A few practical issues. We've got also that theory behind us. How do you start Neuron? Well, when you've installed Neuron, uh, you're going to be getting a typically under under Windows or a Mac, you're going to get a desktop icon. Um, and it'll, look, it'll be labeled with NRNGUI. You could double click on it. Uh, if you're using Windows and you're looking in a file browser, you can double click on a Hoke file if you see one. By the way, I, I recommend to Windows users, um, tell Windows to show you file extensions. You really want to see file extensions, OK? Uh, or you can drag and drop a Hoke file onto the NRNGUI icon that works under MMS Windows and Mac OS. You can configure Linux to do that, but why? Um, as you get more advanced, you're probably going to want to run Neuron from the command line if you're going to be running Neuron and not just using Neuron as a, as a, uh, as a module under Python. So if you're going to start it from the command line, you're going to either be typing NRNGUI or NRNIV. And what does it mean to load the GUI and the standard run libs? Well, we'll see what happens uh, as we go along. Um, so for example, NRNGUI space ba.hoc would execute ba.hoc, would start Neuron. Neuron would read ba.hoc and execute the commands in it, OK? Now, I need to include a little caveat down here about Windows 10, but we're going to skip over that. You Windows user will just have to come back and stare at that and play with it yourselves. OK, what about using Neuron as a Python module? Well, typically, you're going to be then starting Python and executing maybe a Python file. And that Python file will have somewhere in it a statement that imports H from neuron import H. Usually you put this near the top of the file so you can see what modules you're loading. Python users know all about importation, where to, how to organize their programs, or at least they should. If you want to use neurons graphical user interface as well, you'll not only import H but also the GUI. Okay, so that will import that will get uh, make available to Neuron its graphical user interface library and its standard run library. And it will show you the Neuron main menu toolbar. Okay. If you don't want to show the main menu toolbar, but you still want maybe to use those libraries, which are handy, you'll do from Neuron import H and then H dot load file and specify this and Neuron will find that and load it. Okay, so these are the practical issues about how you start Neuron from the command line. And if, by the way, you have a program that completes, Python will automatically, ex automatically exit, unless maybe you use this minus I. So if you have something you want to keep a uh, Neuron window open, Neuron interpreter is still running. Um, Python minus i foo.py, and that'll keep Python from automatically exiting on you. Okay. So let's say you're in Neuron and you want to quit. How do you quit? Well, you could, if you're running Hoke, you'll see an OC prompt, and at the OC prompt, you'll type QUIT open close parens. If you're running Python, you'll see this type <clears throat> Python's typical three right arrows prompt. And you'll type exit, open close parens, and hit return. Or for either of them, if you just hit control D, that'll exit. With this one exception, always with Windows, there's an exception. If you started Neuron with a minus Python option, OK? But you're not going to be using the minus Python option. Okay. Nobody should really be doing that anymore. I know some people might. Okay. All right. So now we're going to talk a little bit about using the GUI to build models and work with them. <clears throat> Why the GUI? Why not just dive right into Python? Well, for one thing, GUI does improve productivity if you're familiar with it because it 
it makes it easier to debug, develop, maintain models. It makes it easier to explore models interactively, uh, to visualize and understand simulation results. These things are at your at your hand at your fingertips immediately. Uh, yes, you can make wonderful graphs with uh, Python, Matplotlib, et cetera, et cetera. But if you're familiar with the graphical user interface, you can be a lot more facile with these things and get a lot more done and very interactively. Okay. Um, I'd really like to see a more updated user graphical interface than what current what Neuron currently has. But nothing I've seen so far has the functionality uh, that parallels what you get out of the box um, from, uh, from Neuron's built-in graphical tools. OK, uh, one of the big advantages of using, excuse me, of using the GUI is that you can avoid writing code. And the less code you have to write, the fewer mistakes you can make. All right, here's a uh, page of, de of uh, debunking gripes about the GUI. The GUI does work well with Python, and the cells that you're exploring under the GUI could be specified in Hoke or Python. They don't have to be specified just in Hoke. So for example, let's say we have a, a, uh, a bit of source code here in a file called puretest.py. And uh, this is in Python. So the first thing we're going to do is we're importing h in the GUI. We use the h.load file to, to read a file called pyr.hoke, where this file contains a hoke template for the peer class that was built and exported from the cell builder, a graphical tool. So this gets a, an instance of the peer class, and then you can create new instances of the peer class with this simple syntax, peer equals h.peer. And then you can load, say, uh, a user interface that you created with Neuron's GUI tools using h.load file and the name of the file that contains those commands that create that user interface. And so you can continue to work in, in Python with using just the names of files that you'd constructed with the GUI, okay? And everything that works from Python will be able to explore all of the sections and mechanisms that you created in this model. All right. So <clears throat> here's an example. This is actually uh, the end result of uh, having done what I just showed you. Okay. Only I'm not showing you the contents of of peer.hoke or um, well, this obviously is the contents of peertest.py. Okay. And this is all running under Python. I just click init and run. And a simulation executes. And we capture a plot of membrane potential as a function of distance along two paths throughout the cell, from one end of the cell to the other, along two different paths in two different colors, and saved nicely in this graph at snapshots in time. OK. So you can do a lot of things with the GUI that would be difficult, if not impossible, to do with user written code. And there are many GUI tools that do this sort of thing, like import 3D. Yes, you can do import 3D from, from Python. Robert will show you how. The linear circuit builder, multiple run fitter, impedance tools for analyzing cell electrical signaling. You can export from many of these tools files that uh, of code that can be reused with Hoke or Python, such as the channel builder, the circuit, uh, excuse me, the channel builder, the cell builder, obviously, linear circuit builder, um, model view even can export NeuroML. And you can create um, graphs and set up user interfaces and save them for later reuse. OK, and there's GUI tool tutorials on this documentation page at this URL at neuron.yale.edu. I'm not sure if they've made it yet to the Read the Docs uh, site. Maybe they have. Uh, that site is being improved all the time, so they might be there. 
Well, there were a few there the last time I looked, but they weren't all present. They might now all be there. Okay. Again, the advantages of the GUI. It always works, can only do what it was designed to do. Coding is best for classical programming tasks like dealing with collections of things, custom initializations, complex, uh, making complex simulation protocols, uh, things that the GUI doesn't handle. And for maximum uh, productivity, you'll use the GUI and user written code. Okay, so now let's talk about building and using models. If they're cell models, you're going to need to specify the branched structure of the cell. That is, what sections are present, whether you're writing code or using the GUI, that's your first task. You have to decide how many sections they're going to be, how they're going to be connected. You have to <clears throat> decide whether you're going to specify the geometry in terms of length and diameter, in which case you're getting a stick figure like cell, or you're going to be using something that has complicated looking anatomies like you might get from import 3D. Okay, in which x, y, z coordinates, uh, excuse me, diameter varies as a function of location in space in a very complicated way along a path. You're going to also need to decide what kind of biophysical properties are going to be in your cell. Where are there going to be different channels? What synapses are attached to the cell? What signal sources are attached to the cell? If, you do, if you're making network models, you're, you're going to have to decide how you're going to define cell classes. You're going to have to create instances of those classes, and you're going to have to connect cells. All right? So these are the tasks, the typical tasks you want to do, making cell models or network models. We're going to focus right now on making cell model. And we're going to use that with the cell builder. And after we use the cell builder to create a model cell, we're going to use the GUI to make an interface for running simulations. Okay, so conceptualize the task is always the first thing you do before you start building a model. You have to decide, are you going to make something that's a stick figure looking cell or is it going to be anatomically detailed? Well, if it's anatomically detailed, you're going to use import 3D. If it's stick figure, you've got to decide how many branches, what are you going to call the branches? How are they going to be oriented in space? What are the lengths and diameters? How are they connected to each other? You have to determine what channels you're going to use. And are they going to be distributed uniformly or non-uniformly over the cell? And are you going to be specing them on a neurite by neurite basis? That is, each individual section gets a different set of channels. Or are you going to be giving, uh, doing a specification in which a whole bunch of sections get the same kind of channels? And maybe channel densities will vary systematically within that set of sections, OK? And you have to decide <clears throat> whether you're writing code that is going to be used just to make a single cell model or to define a cell class that you can come back later and use in a network. A good argument can be made that when you're familiar enough with coding, go ahead and make all your model cells as if you're going to use them in networks. Because if you're really spending a lot of time working on a mo single model cell, you might decide later on you do want to use it in a network. So go ahead and, and from the beginning, implement it as a class definition. OK? But these are your choices you need to make before you write a single line of code or touch the mouse to bring up the cell builder. OK. All right. So here's our first step. Is, is we're going to use the cell builder now to make a stylized model. We've already decided this is the shape of our cell that we want. It's going to have a soma, three apical branches, a basilar branch, and an axon. And we're going to have these anatomical properties, lengths and diameters, for our different branches. And we're going to have these biophysical properties. You'll notice that in the apical branches, Hodgkin Huxley is reduced, uh, Hodgkin Huxley sodium and potassium channel density are reduced to 10% of the normal Hodgkin-Huxley channel densities. And the leak reversal potential has been changed to minus 64 millivolts so that the apical tree rests at minus 65, the same as the soma and the axon and the basilar branch. Okay, 
you notice the basilar branch is going to have an E pass of minus 65. And throughout the entire cell, cytoplasmic resistivity is going to be 160 ohm centimeters and will leave specific membrane capacitance at its default value of one microfarad per square centimeter. Okay, so how do we start? We start neuron either by executing NRNGUI from the system prompt or we can execute Python and then we can execute the command from neuron import HGUI or we could have made a Python file that contains this single command, okay? Or under Windows, we could be lazy and double click on the NRNGUI icon. Once we got, once we've done that, we'll see this thing called the Neuron Main Menu Toolbar and we'll click on Build and there's a pop-up menu or pop down, drop down menu that has a number of tools listed in it and we'll select the Cell Builder and release the mouse button. That gives us a cell builder. The cell builder has some comments here that describe what it does and how to do it. And it has a row of radio buttons across the top. And your typical usage of the cell builder starts with the button on the far left. And as you go through the process of building your model cell, you go from one button to the button on its right, okay? The first thing we do is we want to figure out what we need to know about the cell builder. After that, we're ready to do topology. We're ready to define the branched architecture, architecture of our cell. After that, we'll move on to the next task, again, from left to right, okay? So our first task is to set up the branched architecture of the cell. We start with a SOMA for free. We get something called a SOMA section on our canvas of our cell builder. We want to make a new section, but we want to make the apical tree. So you'll notice that the base name of DEND up here, or the base name for any section we create would be DEND. But we want to have something called AP. Remember, there's our diagram, AP. Okay. So we're going to change the base name by clicking on base name. It pops up a little edit uh, box that allows it to change the section name. And we, collect, we click on accept after we've done that. And now we are ready to make new things. We're going to make a section, our first section. We put our cursor on the canvas of the cell builder. And we click right at that point, And we see this red line. And we can drag it, holding our mouse button down, we can drag it out to the desired length. And when we release it, we see that now we have a thing called AP. Okay, so then we have to do the same for the other two branches of the apical tree. And we have to do the same thing for the basilar dendrite and the axon. Okay, and after we've done all that, we're gonna wanna save a session file. And we do that by clicking on File, Scrolling down to save session in the neuron main menu toolbar. And then we release that button. What is the name of the session file? And we can enter the edit field of that. We can put in whatever string we want. And then we return back to our cell builder and we click on subsets. So now we've, before we got to this point, remember we created all the apical branches, we created the basilar and axon. We see all of these things are highlighted in red. And oh, look, in the middle panel, there is a word all. This is a set that contains all of the sections. We want to make an apical subset because apicals have shared properties. They all have Hodgkin-Huxley with reduced channel densities. So how do we make a subset? We, back in our tool here, notice the cell builder on the subsets page. We click on this button, select subtree. You'll see the word select here in the right hand side, upper right corner. Click on the radio button, select subtree. And then we click on the root of the apical tree, and the apical tree remains red, and the whole rest of the cell turns black. The red sections are the sections that are selected, and we click on new section list, and we 
change the, the, the displayed section name to what we want it to be called. We're going to call it apicals. So we click in this window, um, this edit window. We backspace to get rid of that string, change it to apicals, and click on the accept button. And now we've got a new subset called apicals. You notice it right there in the middle panel. We save a new session file by clicking on the neuro main, neuron main menu toolbars, file, save session. Okay, now we need to deal with geometry. Okay, we need to have, we need to specify a strategy to deal with geometry. Why? Well, because there are a lot of branches here and if there's branches that have similar features, why don't we deal with them all at once? So we're on the specify strategy page. What is common among these different branches? <laughs> All of them have different lengths and diameters. So the all subset is going to have distinct values over the subset for length and diameter. You notice there's red check boxes here. How do those red check boxes get there? I'm not doing this live in front of you, but if I were, I would be clicking on the L box under distinct values over subset. Then I would click on diam box under distinct values over subset. And that would tell the cell builder that I'm going to be specifying each of these sections lengths and each of these sections diameters. Okay. But there is one thing that applies to all of them. D lambda, our strategy for spatial discretization. What's the D lambda rule? The D lambda rule chops sections into pieces such that no piece is longer than some fraction of the length constant at 100 hertz. The default value for that, for that fraction is 0.1, that is 10% of the length constant at 100 hertz. Why that? I can talk about that later. Um, it works out for most cells and it works out very well. It's not the DC length constant, it's the AC length constant, okay? So every branch is gonna be discretized according to the D lambda rule and the D lambda rule implemented in this by the cell builder and in neuron is smart enough to choose an odd value of NSEG. Okay, so it's always gonna give you an odd value of NSEG. NSEG will be large enough, just large enough so that no piece will be longer than whatever the, def whatever the specified value of D lambda is. Okay, now we have our strategy specified. We can clear the specify strategy checkbox by clicking on it. We click on it to make that check mark go away. And now we see the default value of D lambda is 0.1. That's fine with me. That's what we want. But we see all the lengths are 100 microns. So we have to change those, okay? So we go through and we click in each of these numerical fields one at a time and we change them and as we change them manually <clears throat> we'll see that this checkbox appears automatically there what does that checkbox mean that means that you have changed the value in the adjacent numerical field from the default if you click on that checkbox next to soma l the check will go away and the numerical value will go back to the default value and to restore the changed value, you just click, click on the checkbox again and back will come the 20 microns, okay? So that's a nice little convenient feature of the user interface. Once we've set up lengths and diameters for all sections, we wanna save a session file. It's gonna be neuron main menu toolbar, file, save session. And you can overwrite the previously used session file each time you do that, okay? All right, our next task, now that geometry is taken care of, we want to specify biophysical properties. So you'll notice that in our central column, we see the all subset, we see the apical subset, we see the names of each of the sections. Okay, let's base our plan on shared properties. Remember, Soma and Axon have full Hodgkin-Huxley Basler is passive, and the apicals all get reduced Hodgkin-Huxley. Okay, 
So what's our strategy going to be? Well, we're going to click on apicals. Oh, whoops, sorry. Everybody's got cytoplasmic resistivity and specific membrane capacitance. And not only that, but they have the same values in every section. So for the all subset, we click on RA and CM. And that means we are only going to have to enter the value of RA and CM once. And in every section, we'll then get automatically that, that value of RA and that value of CM that we specified. After that, we're going to click on apical Solomon axon, apicals, because those have reduced HH. Soma has full HH, and axon has full HH. So you'll see my last thing I worked on here was I clicked on axon and clicked on the HH button here. OK? If I clicked on the Soma, I would see also that its HH button was checked. And if I clicked on apicals here, I would see that its HH button has been checked as well. Finally, base has pass. So I click on base and click on pass in the right panel. All right. What's left to be done? I click on the specify strategy checkbox to clear it. Now I'm on the parameters page where I can see the parameters for each of these things and I can set the parameters. I want RA to be 160 ohm centimeter. I'm going to leave CM alone. So I click in the RA numerical field, and you'll notice when I click in there and change the value, you notice that it's, it's highlighted in yellow. If I hit return, that yellow highlight goes away, and a red check mark will appear in this checkbox. Okay. I want the apicals to have reduced Hodgkin Huxley, so I click on apicals HH. And then I see a pure GNA bar, GK bar, et cetera, et cetera, all the default values for Hodgkin Huxley. I reduce those by a factor of 10 simply by adding a zero in front of the numerical values for the channel densities. And I change, I edit the numerical value shown here for the leakage reversal potential. I change that to minus 64 millivolts. What about shifting? The value of E pass, well, I click on base pass and I change that to minus 65 millivolts. Okay, now I've taken care of the biophysical properties. I need to save another session file. And now I need to decide what I want to do. Do I want to save this model as a cell class? Well, if I want to do that, on the management page, I click on cell type. I can change the class name by clicking on this class name button that's further down in the in the screen. And I can I would get an editor that would allow me to that would pop up, would allow me to change the name. It's changed it's currently it's called cell. But I might just want to save the whole code in a file without um, without defining a class. Okay? So it depends on what I want to do, which of these buttons I would I would uh, uh, click. Click here. If I want to change, oh, this would be for a cell type. And that would save the whole file that defines a cell type. Okay. If instead I simply want to export Hoke code, I would click on the export button. And I would export it to a file. And all of this information by default will be written to that file. That file will contain the Hoke statements that execute, when executed, will create the model cell I specified in the cell builder. The cell builder is like an order form, like when you're, when you're going to Amazon and you're filling your shopping cart, you haven't actually bought anything yet until you go to exit. You know, you view your shopping cart and you pay whatever it's going to be. And, and that's, that's when you finally get the goodies. Well, with the cell builder, it's a lot like that order form. You don't actually get any, any sections until you um, have exported to a file and then execute that file. <clears throat> or instead, you 
click on the continuous create button. If you click on the continuous create button, instead of exporting a cell class definition or a Hulk file, if you just click on continuous create, that creates all the sections right now in the running section of Neuron. So if you're under Python, all of a sudden, Neuron's computational engine will know all about these sections. And any of the sections that have been created will be knowable to Python according to their Hulk names. So you have a SOMA section, and the Python name for it will be h.soma. Why is it h.soma? Because when you did from Neuron import h, that created, that, that gives you the, the, an object whose name is h, whose members include all of the sections that you've created. And if there is a section called SOMA that you created, its name in Python will be h.soma. So there'll be an h.base, there'll be an h.axon, and there'll be an h.ape, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? All right. Okay, now how do we use the graphical user interface to build an interface for running simulations? Well, we have our model cell, we need to stimulate it, we need to trigger a spike. We need to show plots of, of membrane potential at the SOMA. And we'd like to show membrane potential along a path from one end of this model cell to the other. So we're going to need a, a run button, a button we can click on to launch a simulation. How do we get that run button? How do we get graphs that will show results? How, where do we get a stimulator from? Because all we've got is the model cell. OK, I'm assuming that what we've done is toggled continuous create on and then turned it off or, or just left it on, OK? So now we've got our sections. How are we going to do these things? Well, first thing, we get a run control. That's going to give us our run button. In the Neuron Main Menu toolbar, you click on Tools. You scroll down to Run Control, and you release the mouse button. And sure enough, there's this thing, this run control panel. It's got a bunch of buttons. And it has some numeric fields. And some of these are things you can change. And some of these things are just reporting stuff to you. So for example, you can change the value of the membrane potential you initialize the cell to. If you click on init, the cell will, all the sections will be initialized to that numerical value of millivolts, minus 65 millivolts. OK? Time will be set to 0. And all conductances will be set to their steady state values at minus 65 millivolts. If you click on init and run, it does an initialization, which is all this stuff up here, setting time to zero, um, initializing all conductances to steady state at minus 65 millivolts, etc. And then it launches a simulation. OK? And if you have a very long simulation and you need to stop it, you can click on the stop button. And it should stop. OK? What about all these other buttons? Well, they're useful in certain circumstances. I'm going to skip over these right now and go to these. T, this numeric field next to the T button, that the T button doesn't do anything. And all that this numeric field does is it shows you the current time in the software zero milliseconds, the start of a simulation, OK? You can change that manually, but it won't do anything, OK? When you initialize, it'll always go back to zero. T stop. This actually does something. If you change the value displayed here, you will change how long the simulation runs. So we could change it to 5,000 if we wanted, or 50, or 20, OK? All right. These other buttons, these two buttons interact. Uh, we can talk about this later, but I think I'm going to skip over that. And this little slide shows all the gory details. Let's go on to how do we get a graph? Because we've got our run control, we want to make a graph, a plot of membrane potential as a function of time. So we click on in the menu, menu toolbar, we click on graph 
voltage axis, blood up the mouse button, there's our graph. It shows V of 0.5. Well, that's Hoke for membrane potential at the middle of the default section. The default section is always the first section in the cell builder. Since that first section was called SOMA, that is to Python, that would be SOMA parens 0.5 close parens dot V. Okay, that would be our, the name of it. If we had said SOMA equals H dot SOMA, okay, because Python doesn't know the names of these things except through the H object. And you can either refer to them directly via the H object or you can create an alias. Well, Robert will show you some of that later. Giving you a lot of tasks, Robert. Okay, now we want to plot membrane potential along a graph, along a path. So we click on graph shape plot. And what we get is a stick figure of the cell. And we want to plot membrane potential along a path that extends from the most remote part of the axon to the most remote part of the longest apical dendrite. So we click on the menu box of the graph. Every graph has a menu box in its upper left corner. We click on that menu box. We get a menu of things. And we can scroll down that menu with our mouse cursor until we get the space plot. And we release our button. And then we see in our shape plot, I'm not showing all the window decorations, we click just left of that apical dendrite end, distal end, and we drag, we hold our mouse button down and we drag our cursor over to the distal end, just past the distal end of that longest apical section. And you'll see there's like this rubber band line that we stretch from left to right. And then when we release the button, we see the path is highlighted in red. And we get a pop-up, which is a graph, a plot of membrane potential versus distance along that very path. At this point, we should save a session file. Now we need a stimulator. We get a stimulator. A stimulator is a point process. It's in particular, we want a current clamp. So we click on tools. We scroll down to point processes. Holding that mouse button down, scroll to the right. We see a little secondary menu. Managers, viewers, we want managers. Keeping that mouse button depressed, scroll to the right, and we get a tertiary menu. We can click on point manager. OK? So that is a point process manager we're going to get. All right? And this is what it looks like. This thing can manage any kind of point process that Neuron knows about. So we want to turn this into a current clamp. And we click on Select Point Process. And we scroll down to Eye Clamp. And we release the mouse button. And there we see now a panel that shows us that we have a current clamp at the middle of the soma. This upper field tells us where it's, what the thing is that it's managing and where it's located. And it gives us, which exposes the current clamp's parameters, which are how long before the current pulse starts, what's the duration of the current pulse, and what's the amplitude of that. And we can click in these fields and change these values to whatever we want. Or we, well, we'll just change them manually, OK? OK, so now here is our user interface. I have got our four different windows that we created with the GUI, and I've arranged them left to right. Here's our run control. Here's our current clamp manager. And here's the plot of membrane potential as a function of time and membrane potential along the length of a section. And we should now, once we've got this all nicely constructed like this, let's save a session file. Um, I see beginners with windows all over the screen on top of each other. It's very complicated. You can't remember where anything is. Very disorderly. Maybe that looks like your desktop in the real world. But in your computer, where you have relatively little horizontal space to spread things out on, I find it's very helpful to arrange things in a compact array so that you can work with them easily. 
okay? So I strongly recommend um, GUI window discipline, okay? And once you've got things arranged, you can save them to a session file, and that session file will contain statements that will recreate this when you use Neuron to load it. Okay, so if we now clicked on Indent and Run, this is what we see. All right, and you see I have adjusted the stimulus parameters to give us a stimulus that starts at one millisecond. It's only tenth of a millisecond duration. The cell takes a while to decide whether it's going to spike. Well, that's actually the sodium and potassium channels are opening, but the sodium channels are a little faster. So we get a spike and we get evolution of this graph here. Now, how do we get something that looks nice? Well, we would want to do a movie run. And here's how to do a movie run. Click on Tools, scroll down to Movie Run. And then if you get this Movie Run tool, you click on the Init and Run button, and oops, and the simulation will evolve gradually in time over in a way that you'll be able to actually see things happen. Well, what does that mean? Well, let me see if I can show you. Whoops. All right, so here is <clears throat> over here on the left side of the screen. Okay, on the left side of the screen, you'll see my neuron, men neuron main menu toolbar, you'll see my run control, you'll see my point process manager. It says it's a current clamp at the middle of the soma. Oh, and there's a little blue dot there, by the way. And we can use that little blue dot to relocate the, we can actually click on different parts of the cell to move that stimulus to different locations in the cell. I'm not going to do that right now. I'll leave that to you to do on your own time. And we've got our plot of membrane potential versus time and membrane potential along a path in the cell from this branch to the end of this branch. And if I click on init and run, you'll see that I instantly get this. Well, what if I want to see things evolve nicely in time? Tools, movie run. There's the movie run panel. I click on init and run. Watch what happens. Ooh, that was nice. How do we make it slower? I can increase the seconds per step, and it'll run slower. Click on init and run. There we go. Very good. Now let's say we want to do something even fancier than that. Let's say I want to capture an ensemble of traces in this space plot. How do I capture an ensemble of traces? Well, what I want to do is I want to snapshot, I want to snapshot this as the simulation advances. I want to snapshot this window at regular intervals, okay? So how am I going to do that? Well, what I'll do is I will change I will put this graph in keep lines mode. So I click in the menu box, the grass menu box, scroll down to keep lines. And now I see keep lines is on. There it is, it's on. And now I'm going to change points plotted for milliseconds to four. And what that's going to do is every quarter of a millisecond, I will get a snapshot of membrane potential along the length of the cell, along that path. Click on indent and run. Whoa. Let's do that for 10 milliseconds to get the whole evolution, okay? Okay, so you'll see the action potential propagating away from the soma into the axon, and you see it's very nice, full developed, pretty good amplitude there, almost 40 millivolts, which is reversible, well, reversible potential for sodium. And you'll see that in the apical dendrites, the potential isn't quite as high, but it is an action potential. It does propagate. And you'll notice that it drops right here in amplitude. What's right here? Oh, that's where the branch point is. That's where the depolarizing current spreading in back into the apical dendrite 
now has two places to go, a whole lot more membrane to charge downstream so that the propagation slows a bit when it reaches this point. And neither of these branches gets quite as big a depolarizing current as the parent had while the spike was propagating it out in it. So we see a slight drop of peak, peak spike amplitude in these narrower branches. And then as we approach the ends, we see the peak amplitude increase. Does anybody know why the peak amplitude increases as you approach the end? Anybody know what that phenomenon is? I read about it anywhere. Audience okay, participation it's called time. Beg your pardon? All oh, right, well. Audience participation time. Yes, it is audience participation time. Does anybody make a wild guess? Okay, here's what your reading assignment is. Read about sealed end effect or downstream load, okay? Or reflection, okay? All right, and we can, uh, we can talk about uh, this some other time. Course is too short today for us to get into any of those details. So at this point, I'm going to say, let's all get a coffee break. All right, and we'll come back at 40 after. Right, 20 minutes to the hour, we will return. We will restart. I am sitting here and can answer questions if you want to type some questions into the chat, or if you want to say some questions. Uh, Robert, do I have a, um, can I have uh, privileges to uh, enable uh, speakers? Uh, I think anybody can just unmute if they want. Okay, good. But I will make you co-host. All right, great. Everybody knows everything, I guess.
Okay, I see it's um, 20 minutes to the hour. Um, are there any uh, any other questions? Okay, um, I am uh, seized by a sudden inspiration to try something a little different before I go on to the end model talk. Uh, this simulation showed what happened if we applied a stimulus to the soma. I think what I'd like to do at this point is to change this to a synaptic mechanism, this eye clamp, and move it out into the apical dendrites. So first thing I'm going to do is to change it to an alpha synapse. An alpha synapse is a um, rather crude uh, synaptic mechanism. It produces a single conductance change transient at a user specifiable onset that has a user specifiable time constant that governs its time course. And we can specify its reversal potential and its maximum conductance. So I'm going to just, <clears throat> for the moment, leave it at the cell body. And uh, we now have a mechanism that a synaptic mechanism attached to cell body that's excitatory. It's going to have a fast rise time for its conductance, like an ergic synapse. And if I run a simulation, <clears throat> you notice barely anything, OK? Barely anything at all. So I would like to see what that little bulge looks like. I'll click here in this graph's menu box and scroll over to view equals plot. That rescales the y-axis and the x-axis to fit whatever transient was there. So I'm seeing a very tiny, very tiny EPSP. Let me change that to 10 times larger and run another simulation. Oh, I better do a view equals plot again. So now this is a 4 millivolt <clears throat> EPSP. That's quite an EPSP. That would be like, uh, like about uh, five or six uh, unitary uh, synapses, uh, unitary amperergic synapses attached to the cell body. And if I wanted to, I can look back at the shape and I could move that excitatory synapse out into a dendrite. Just click on a dendrite and put it somewhere. OK, you'll see it it can only attach to nodes existing in sec. Okay. Oh, my internet connection is unstable. Thank you, Yale. Thank you, Frontier. Um, I'm going to run another simulation here. And we can see it's a tiny depolarization. And now if I make that peak conductance 10 times bigger, and run a simulation. Whoa, I get a spike. And let's do, there's a spike. It takes a while to get there, but it's a spike. OK, and if I want to see how that evolves in it, I can go back to, I can go back to my four points per millisecond. And I can turn this back to keep lines. And I can do an init and run. Well, I don't want to do it keep lines. Forget keep lines for now. Let's do a knit and run. Movie run. That's too fast. Knit and run. Let's go here, continue for one millisecond. And I can single step through, and I can see how that spike is generated. 
I could change the stimulus intensity a bit. That was a heck of a giant depolarization out there. But as you can see, what I got was a back propagating spike. Okay. All right. So we can have all kinds of fun with this. And I can save it to a session file. And it will come up and recreate this user interface with that alpha synapse, with that peak conductance, and those other parameters. Exactly. So I can reproduce what I just did. No more excuses about the simulation that got away. OK? Very easy to go back to what you were doing with the GUI. OK. I'm about to quit that. And now 